the, the state of the race because some of your supporters are disappointed that your campaign has yet to catch fire the way they would want in terms of polling. Uh, one Republican pollster, one who is sympathetic to you, I was asking her about your campaign, and she said she thought the issue was you bumped up at the beginning because voters, Republican voters, saw you as a more electable conservative like Trump, like you, Trump without the baggage. But then they say as you go further and further to the right on some of these divisive social issues that could alienate moderates, suburban moms, etc., Republican voters see you as less and less electable. Uh, what do you say to that analysis? Well, I don't think it's true. I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, I took a state that had been a one-point state, and we won it by 20 percentage points, 1.5 million votes. Uh, our bread and butter were people like suburban moms. Uh, we're leading a big movement for, for parents' rights, to have the parents be involved in education, school choice, get the indoctrination out of schools. And of course, there's bread and butter issues that matter, too. Inflation, uh, more economic opportunity. Florida's economy is ranked number one of all 50 states. We've worked hard. Uh, to make that happen. Crime, you see crime in all these different communities uh, that is now even going into suburbs and some areas. So I think that there's a lot of things. I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason is, is uh, I was getting a lot of media attention at the time coming off the victory. I had to do my job as governor with my legislative session and we had a great legislative session. We did a lot of great things, actually things that are appeal to huge majorities of the, of the population. So I think that that analysis is wrong. Um, but I had to do that. And so I was basically taking five uh, really non-stop since then because a lot of people view me as a threat. I think the left views me as a threat because they think I'll beat Biden and actually deliver on all this stuff. And then, of course, people that have their allegiances within the allegiances in the Republican side, you know, have gone after me. But the reality is this is a state by state process. I'm not running a campaign to try to juice, you know, whatever we are in the national polls. I mean, I, whatever we did in the CNN compared, whatever, it's fine. I'm definitely doing better than everybody else. But it's state else. by state, obviously. It's state by state. Right. So we're focused on on building an organization, you got to get people to come out in the middle of January in Iowa uh, to caucus for you. That requires an organization, requires to know where those votes are. Now, that is not going to make the same type of splash uh, as if you were trying to run ads nationally or do those other things. And so uh, we've been making you know, really good progress. I think this weekend was really good in terms of the family leader and some of the other things we were doing in Iowa. Of course, we're here in South Carolina. We're going to do a lot in New Hampshire. But that's going to be our focus, focusing on those early states, continuing to build our coalitions and going forward. And I would also just note, Jake, there is a narrative that they're almost trying a little too hard with this to try to say, because they've been saying that I've been doing poorly for my whole time as governor, basically. This is always the case during COVID. Oh, you know, he has a state open. He's going to lose. Then he fought Disney. He's going to lose. And then this. So they always want to get there. It never quite works out. And in fact, I actually remember you, you did the debate with us in 18. Sure. And before we did the debate on CNN, and you didn't have anything to do with this, CNN released a poll saying I was down like 14 or 15 points. Now, that was the narrative at the time. He's going down. So I think some of this is motivated reasoning, but I kind of get a kick out when they say he didn't fundraise well when I did more than Biden and Trump in the second quarter, and I'm just a governor. So I didn't believe that poll was accurate, just for the <laughs> record. Um, your new policy that you announced today about the military would ban transgender Americans from serving in the military, regardless of their ability. And this comes on the heels of your campaign retweeting a video that the log cabin Republicans, which is a conservative LGBTQ group, said, quote, ventured into homophobic territory, unquote. There are more than a million trans adults in the U.S. What are their lives and the lives of the people who love and support them going to be like under a DeSantis administration? Well, look, in the military, it's all about the mission first. So there's a whole bunch of reasons uh, why you focus on mission first. People's individuality, it does take, you, you do have to check that at the door. And that's not the only example. There's a whole host of other examples. So I think the military culture is unique in terms of that. Now, in terms of the larger issue, the question is, is, you know, what role does someone that's a man have in women's activities, even if they conceive of themselves to be a woman? I think it's wrong to have men compete in women's sports. And I understand some of those men conceive of themselves differently, but it's not fair to the girls who are competing. It's not fair to the women athletes. The swimmers who lost that national championship uh, to the Penn swimmer, I mean, they've been training too. So I don't think it's good for that. And I think having things like locker rooms where they're having to share uh, with somebody who's of the opposite sex, you know, I, I think is wrong. So I would respect everybody, but what I wouldn't do is turn society upside down uh, to be able to accommodate, which is a very, very small percentage of the population. Last question about your military policy, because your new military policy says that the Pentagon should never prioritize climate politics over national security. Uh, 
but this week we heard from the Associate Director of Military Affairs for the CIA, who told a room full of National Guard leaders and allies from other countries that climate change supercharges almost every other global threat because of refugees, because of conflicts, because of all sorts of reasons. What's your response to that, the idea that climate politics isn't about politics, it's about national security? Well, here's the thing. How are you going to equip your fighting force to win? Are you going to put those considerations in? Or are you going to create the most lethal force available? I can tell you, China is not going to use those considerations. If they need to burn more coal to defend their country, they are going to burn more coal to defend their country. So I just don't think it should be a factor in terms of how we project po uh, power in this country. Focus on how lethal we can be and focus on, on getting the mission done. Uh, I don't want to force the Department of Defense to be using electric vehicles. I just don't think that that's something uh, that makes any sense. You entered your candidacy officially for the Republican contest here in South Carolina. Before you go, are you going to win South Carolina? Yeah, we are. I think this is a great setup for me. I'm the only veteran running. I'll be the first president elected since 1988 that served in a war. There's very few states in this country with a stronger active duty military presence and veteran presence than here. Uh, we've also got great support in the upcountry in South Carolina that we're building. And of course, my wife went to college at Charleston, so we know the low country well, and I think we're gonna be able to build a lot of support here. So this is a great state for us, and the way the calendar's working out, you're gonna have New Hampshire in late July, or Ju January, and then here in late February. So we're gonna be spending a lot of time, you're gonna be spending a lot of time in South Carolina. All right, Governor DeSantis, thanks right, so much thanks. for your time today. I appreciate, appreciate your military you. policy you proposed uh, that, in your words, uh, will rip the woke out of the military. The Pentagon response is that Army and Marines readiness is the best it's been in years, uh, and reenlistment in the Army is the best it's been in years. So their argument might be in response, what problem are you trying to solve? Well, why do we have the worst recruiting uh, that we've had since the Vietnam conflict? Uh, why have great warriors being driven off, such as with the COVID-19 shot mandates? These were people that had been performing admirably. A lot of them had had COVID. They had natural immunity. They were told, take this shot or leave. So I think you've had a big problem uh, with morale. You clearly have a problem with recruiting. And at this level, everybody has acknowledged these recruiting levels are at a crisis. Why is that the case? I think it's because people see the military losing its way, not focusing on the mission and focusing on a lot of these other things, which, man, we see that in other aspects of society as well. People want to join the military, I think, because they think it's something different. And I think some of the civilian leaders in the military are trying to have the military mimic corporate America academia. That's ultimately not going to work. So I hear you. Recruitment, without question, is a problem. The Army did this survey. Uh, I'll give you a copy of it if you want. They haven't released it, but I got my hands on a copy. And it looked at, it surveyed people, I think 16 to 28 barriers to service, and beyond the ones such as don't want to die, don't want to be injured, don't want to be away from my family. The biggest issues were the number two issue, women and racial or ethnic minorities are discriminated against in the Army. Wokeness is listed here, but it's only it's only number nine. Um, so that would suggest that wokeness is not as big. Well, but I think there's an issue about, like not everyone really knows what wokeness is. I mean, I've defined it, but a lot of people who rail against wokeness can't even define it. And so I think it's a sense of, you know, this is not something that's, that's holding true to the core martial values that make the military unique. Uh, and I can tell you, the veterans, you don't have to look far and wide. Go to a VFW hall, go to an American Legion. Uh, there's huge amount of concern about the direction uh, that the military is going with all this. And here's the thing, things like DEI and all that stuff, it hasn't worked in other aspects of society. It very well may be on the constitutional chopping block in light of the uh, Supreme Court's decision on, on racial discrimination in higher education. And so it's not a model that I think is going to be successful in the military. And so we're going to do uh, what has been successful in the past, and I think you're going to see better recruiting as a result. So the Pentagon says that they do try to achieve diversity in recruiting, but not when it comes to promotions, that's all merit-based. Well, I mean, I think that we have seen standards uh, uh, watered down in different situations. I, I think that that's probably not accurate. Obviously, they're going to say they're doing a good job. I mean, we get that. That's going to be uh, their thing. But, but I don't think that that's uh, in tune with reality. So um, let's turn to foreign policy, because obviously that goes hand in hand with military policy in many ways. As a congressman in 2015, you strongly backed arming Ukraine after Russia invaded and seized uh, Crimea. As a presidential candidate, you've said that the conflict is not a vital 
national interest. So as president, what will, your, what will your policy be? Will you want to stop arming Ukraine? Will you stop financial support for Ukraine? So first, a vital national interest to me means we would potentially send troops there. And I don't think anybody wants to see troops in Ukraine. And I would believe that in 2015 as well. It's more of a secondary or, or tertiary interest. So my policy is going to be very simple. Our number one threat to our country is from China in terms of foreign threat. We also have a threat of being able to not secure our own border. Tens of thousands of people are dying every year because the cartels are running fentanyl. So you gotta be strong at home if you wanna be strong abroad. We are gonna approach the world, instead of Europe being the focus like it has been since World War II, and it was understandable why it would be after World War II. NATO, stopping the Soviets, I get it. But now the Asia Pacific really needs to be to our generation what Europe was to the post-World War II generation. And so what we're doing is how much hard power can we marshal as much as possible to deter China? I think we're in a situation now with how weak we've been uh, that we are going towards maybe having a conflict with China. I think the way to deter that conflict with China is to be strong. So I would have the Europeans do more in Europe um, that's more in their backyard. That's more of an interest for them. You know, I would be willing to be helpful to try to bring it to a conclusion there, but I am not going to diminish our stocks and not send to, to Taiwan. I'm not going to make us less capable to respond to exigencies. And you got to care at least as much about your own border as you do about foreign borders. So when you talk about trying to bring, uh, bring an end to the conflict, would you um, push Zelensky to make concessions to Russia to cede land that Russia seized in, in, in its attack? So what I would say is what the goal should be a sustainable, enduring peace in Europe, but that one that does not reward aggression. And there's gonna be different levers that you're gonna be able to pull. We will pull some levers against Russia. We're gonna do be much more aggressive on energy and export, because I think that's been Putin's lifeline. I want the Europeans dependent on the United States for that, not him. We're also gonna turn the screws on the Iranians. The Iranians have been one of Putin's biggest benefactors, and they've benefited from Biden's approach there. So, so we'll use the leverage that we have uh, but the goal is going to be a sustainable peace that does not reward aggression. What do you say to the argument that Xi Jinping is watching the U.S. response to Ukraine to game out how the U.S. would respond if China invaded Taiwan? President Biden has said that U.S. forces would defend Taiwan if China invaded. Would you do the same? Would you order the U.S. military to defend Taiwan? Well, two things. So first, how does China view this? I mean, it's somewhat speculative. Uh, I think what they would like to see in Russia, Ukraine is a multi-year stalemate and quagmire where the West is pouring in 100 billion, another 200 billion dollars of weapons. Our stocks continue to decline. They don't really care about the Russians. Russia will be more dependent on China as a result of that. So I think that's what Xi would like to see ideally. Now, in terms of Taiwan, that is a significant interest of the United States. Taiwan is a strong ally. Uh, Taiwan is important for us economically and for a variety of other reasons. Also, uh, a potential Chinese attack on Taiwan successfully would have big reverberations in the Asia Pacific. But our policy is gonna be very simple. We're gonna deter that from happening. China respects hard power. If you have hard power, if you have strong alliances with the Japanese, so I visited there a few, few months ago. The Koreans and the Japanese are getting along now. They never used to get along because they both see the threat uh, posed by China. So we're gonna work together, we're gonna be much stronger, we're gonna project power, and we're gonna deter that from happening. Let's talk about some issues here uh, in the United States. Uh, you've been asked by this by a number of uh, members of conservative media, and you have yet to give a yes or no answer. You recently signed a six-week abortion ban in Florida Yes or no, would you support that as a nationwide ban? So I said I'm pro-life, I will be a pro-life president, um, and we will support pro-life policies. Um, at the same time, I look at what's going on in the Congress, and you know, I don't see them you know, making very much headway. I think the danger from Congress is if we lose the election, they're gonna try to nationalize abortion up until the moment of birth. And in some liberal states, you actually have post-birth abortions. And I think that that's wrong. Also, with respect to the military thing that we talked about, we're gonna reverse the abortion tourism policy in the Department of Defense. They're actually paying people uh, to go and get abortions with American tax dollars as part of the military. They won't even pay you, you lose a loved one. You don't get that type of time off to be you able to go. I have to ask about the breaking news today. Sure. Uh, your chief competitor, the front runner right now, uh, Donald Trump, says he was informed 
that he is the target of special counsel Jack Smith's investigation into efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. And Mr. Trump has until Thursday to report to the grand jury. If Jack Smith has evidence of criminality, should Donald Trump be held accountable? So here's the problem. Uh, this country is going down the road of criminalizing political differences. And I think that's wrong. Alvin Bragg stretched a statute in, in Manhattan to be able to try to target Donald Trump. Most people, even people on the left acknowledge, if that wasn't Trump, that case would not have likely been brought uh, against a normal civilian. And so you have a situation where the Department of Justice, FBI, uh, have been weaponized uh, against people they don't like. And the number one example of that happened to be against Donald Trump with the Russia collusion. Uh, that was not a legitimate investigation that was being done to try to drive Trump out of office. And so what I've said as president, my job is to restore a single standard of justice to end weaponization of these agencies. We're gonna have a new FBI director on day one. Uh, we're gonna have big changes at the Department of Justice. Americans across the political spectrum need to have confidence that what is going on is based on the rule of law, not based on what political tribe you're in. And then the second thing I would say is, this country needs to have a debate about the country's future. If I'm the nominee, we'll be able to focus on President Biden's failures, and I'll be able to articulate a positive vision for the future. Uh, I don't think it serves us good to have a presidential election focused on what happened four years ago uh, in January. And so I wanna focus on looking forward. I don't wanna look back. I, I do not wanna see him. I hope he doesn't get charged. I don't think it'll be good for the country. Uh, but at the same time, I've gotta focus on looking forward and that's what we're gonna do. Jack Smith has um, prosecuted Democrats too. I mean, he prosecuted, or at least was part of the prosecution of Senator Menendez, uh, Senator John Edwards. Are you saying that if he finds evidence of criminality, he should not charge Donald Trump anyway? What, what I'm saying is, when you're going after somebody on the other side of the political spectrum, if you're stretching statutes to try to criminalize maybe political disagreements, that is wrong. Now, look, this is all speculation, but I think we've gone down the road in this country of trying to criminalize uh, differences in politics rather than saying, okay, you don't like somebody, then defeat them in the election rather than trying to use uh, the, the justice system. So we don't know what's gonna happen, but I can tell you with the Bragg one, that was stretching criminal law. The evidence of criminality was, was very weak, and even if that, that existed, other people would not have been charged under those circumstances. That's the problem. In its way, not focusing on the mission and focusing on a lot of these other things, things like DEI and all that stuff, it hasn't worked in other aspects of society. It very well may be on the constitutional chopping block in light of the uh, Supreme Court's decision on, on racial discrimination in higher education. And so it's not a model that I think is going to be successful in the military. DEI, of course, a reference to diversity, equity, and inclusion measures. That was Republican presidential candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis outlining why he unveiled a new plan to eliminate so-called wokeness from the U.S. military. That was during my exclusive interview with him on the campaign trail in South Carolina. The DeSantis plan for the military includes ending all groups and positions in the Pentagon that focus on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, banning transgender service members from being able to serve as they identify, uh, and ending funding for what he calls, quote, activist climate change programs. DeSantis also wants to reinstate all service members who had been removed for refusing the COVID vaccine. And he wants to punish retired generals and admirals who speak out harshly against any sitting president, Congress, or other officials. Joining us now to discuss is the former commanding general for the U.S. Army Europe and 7th Army, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, who's also a CNN military analyst. General, thanks so much for joining us. So DeSantis says the military is losing its way by focusing on DEI and other what he called woke initiatives. As someone's with decades, someone with decades of military experience who still has contacts in the in the Pentagon right now, uh, do you agree? How do you see it? I disagree with that completely, Jake. I'll be honest with you. I, I not only have contacts still with forces, but I'm a mentor to several organizations in some in a leadership program. I work with basic trainees and their their commanders. I've done some things with other services, all uh, with an approach to how we can be better as a military. And truthfully, I don't understand what Governor DeSantis is talking about in some of these things. And neither do most of the people in the military. This is not an issue that is for, 
at the forefront of anyone that I've talked to in the military. So Governor DeSantis um, also wants to punish, uh, prosecute former members of the military, high-ranking officials who engage in harsh politics, uh, you know, really tough criticism of a sitting president, for example. Uh, what do you make of that? You know, what's interesting about it, um, I was talking to somebody at the Pentagon about this proposal, and he said, you know, his mind was open to it, but he said, you know, the first person that, that would be prosecuted, the, the worst defender of all this, is Mike Flynn. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I, what I've tried to do with CNN, Jake, and you know this, is comment on policies or what the, the political leaders are doing. I've never tried to attack a sitting political leader. I'm not defending myself, but certainly there were times during the previous administration and even sometimes during this administration where I've said a policy is something that is approached in a different way in the military than what a sitting president or uh, a government official is addressing. That could be construed uh, as, you know, taking pot shots at a political figure. It's trying to inform the American people about the, the way the military view things. I take the four decades that I've had in the military and say, hey, here's how those who are wearing the cloth of the country feel about this particular action, just like we're doing now. Uh, you know, I, I don't see any wokeness in our military. I've been uh, honored to serve since the start of my service in a very diverse force, uh, serving alongside all races, religions, cultures, men and women. One in five of our military uh, force today of about two million are, are women, and that's about 400,000 members of our force. So some of the things that Governor DeSantis is talking about, I think he's disconnected from what the military actually does and, and what they're made up of. Is there an argument for, um, for transgender service members not being allowed to, to serve as they want to, as they identify, a trans woman identifying as a woman? Is there an argument uh, in DeSantis's favor for that? I, I don't believe so, uh, but again, I have a different view of this. Uh, our military is an all volunteer force. It has been that way since the mid eighties. It's a very diverse force and truthfully, it's the best in the world. People volunteer to serve men and women. They swear an oath to our constitution, which outlines our values, our national values, like dignity and respect for all people. Sometime during the history of our military, we failed in that. Uh, with races, with women, uh, in, in some other areas. So if someone is qualified to serve uh, and they meet the standards, which I, I heard Governor DeSantis sort of dance around yesterday, I personally, as a member of the military, believe they should serve because they contribute a great deal to the diversity, and I'll use that word, and the wokeness, which means you're investigating things uh, within the military. I consider myself woke, Jake. Uh, I will honestly say that not only as a, as a soldier, but as a now citizen of Florida, I'm woke and I still live in Florida because I like to investigate things. I like to analyze things. I like to expand my view uh, of not only how our military works, but how our enemies and our, our allies work as well. Well, how, how would you define woke? Because it, uh, as Governor DeSantis noted yesterday, uh, even many people who rail against wokeness, and he, he, he certainly is against wokeness as he defines it, uh, don't have a definition. How, how would you define it? Well, he, I've never heard him give a definition. I've heard one of his lawyers give a definition. And if the definition his lawyer gave is cr the correct one, then I'm going to say I'm woke. It's someone that looks outside their normal field of view. It's someone that opens their aperture to different viewpoints to try and analyze things in maybe a unique way, to try and not go along with common cultural bias, but in fact, find out more things uh, about a particular subject. That's what the military does. We're not taught what to think. We are taught how to think, uh, because that's a very valuable attribute when you're, when you're talking about dealing with not only our allies, but with our enemies. We have to dig into uh, the view of different cultures, different people. You know, my last job was as, a, as the commander of forces in Europe. And, you know, truthfully, I dealt with 49 other countries and the culture of those nations. And I had to deal with them to build alliances for different uh, things that we were doing, both in Afghanistan and in the continent. Uh, so, you know, I needed to look at other cultures 
I need to look to see other people's points of view. And to me, that's how I define woke, to try and expand my view of, of what other people think and how they see the world. Retired Lieutenant General Mark Kirtling, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the McCad TV family. Please like and share McCad TV. We love you all. Please support McCad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.